Hey everyone, it is Wednesday. Guess what? I missed y'all last week. I was just telling Chad and JB how much I missed them last week too. Hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Welcome to Dentist in the Know. This is your backstage pass for current trends, politics, and education in the dental world. As always, it is live and it is over a lovely cocktail to end the day. I'm still in my... Uh, uniform here. That's the kind of day we had here in South Carolina. But uh, tonight drinking a nice little bottle of Banshee Pinot Noir. I know Chad knows it well. There you go. There it is. Anyway, um, we are so excited to have you all here. As you know, Dennis in the Know is your backstage pass for current trends, politics, and education in the dental world. We do it over a cocktail. And all three of us, Dr. Jennifer Bell, who's coming up now, Dr. Chad Duplantis, and myself, we are all business owners, we are all dentists, and we are all educators. And our job is to bring all of you in the know. Guys, I am really excited about tonight's show. Um, first of all, we have to thank Spear Education for sponsoring our show tonight and uh, helping us get our amazing guest tonight, who, uh, you know, you, we've been talking about it all week. Dr. Jeff Rouse is with us, and um, I'm sure all of you know that name. If you've not had the pleasure of ever listening to him, um, this is something that you absolutely must do. You can certainly catch up with him at Spear Education. Uh, but he is uh, probably one of the most enlightened practitioners I've ever listened to. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't say those words lightly. Um, he is someone who's not been afraid to take a few punches thinking outside the box with mm -hmm. regards to growth and development and airway and um, just how much more intervention we could be providing in the field of dentistry. So it's really an honor for us to, to have Jeff on the show tonight. And, uh, and we're so thankful to Spear Education for uh, allowing us this opportunity and, and for sponsoring the show tonight. So um, pretty exciting, huh? It Very. is. And it is. And if, if anybody's looking for an educational outlet, Spear is certainly one of the top ones to do it at. Uh, Dr. Frank Spear is just an amazing human being that really just just really enlightens the dental world. And uh, they have a great curriculum. I've done several of them. I have not finished the curriculum, but I've I've been member of several Spear study clubs and been out to the Institute several times, blown away by what they do. Um, I'm too excited about our guest, uh, Dr. Jeff Rouse. I knew him as a general dentist, then be he became a prosthodontist, and then he became, you know, really involved in the airway field. And it's just been really exciting to watch his career and the number of, you know, calls and messages we've gotten this week. Everybody's like, oh, Dr. Rouse, Dr. Rouse, Dr. Rouse. It's been amazing. So, Really looking forward to it. And like Jeff said, thank you to Spear. Awesome. I had the pleasure of taking his course. Of, uh, it's been quite a few years now, actually, when I think about it. Um, I was hosting the AGD meeting for that year in North Carolina. And I actually had he, I had him and Bill out uh, to do two courses for us. And first off, the content was amazing. So if you haven't had a chance to, to take Dr. Rouse's course, um, on airway management with a prosthodontic focus, I would highly encourage you to do so. And Spear's a great place to do that. But second, uh, it, rev it revolutionized the way that I look at patients. That was the, my beginning eye-opening experience in airway management. And I really dug in pretty deep after that. So um, without a doubt, this is kind of part of my journey, I think, as a general dentist. So I'm excited to have him on here. Um, kind of excited to, to see him uh, on the, uh, it's almost been a decade actually since I had him at, at the North Carolina AGD. So uh, seeing him at, at a different stage in my journey to have more uh, concrete uh, 
questions when I was, I saw him the first time I had no idea about airway management, how to look at patients, understand and diagnose. So uh, fast forward 10 years later, I have a little bit better understanding. So for me, you're going to watch me fangirl a little bit, I think tonight. <laughs> Uh, that that would be funny because I got to watch I I got to watch Chad go go fanboy last week with uh, with Pasco Manya. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that, that's true. That was that it's was true. legit. I'm sorry, I'm gonna admit I yeah. I got there's hey, no you know, what? you know what? If you gotta have heroes, those are good ones, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're not dumpster diving here, people. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, JB, do you got do you have uh, some news for us? I do two have weeks, some news. I should hope guys, so. it's been two weeks. It's yeah. been two weeks. I don't know how everyone has survived without being in the know, like truly having dental news to talk about. Well, nothing. You don't have an nothing. uncle. Larry. I guess we survived fine then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get to it. So, uh, the first thing that uh, I wanted to chat about was actually a bill that came out. Uh, was it early this year or late last year? We talked a little bit about the No Surprise Billing Act that came out um, as a response more in the medical field, uh, specifically talking about not giving patients surprise bills at the end. They should have a better understanding of the services that are being provided and financially how to afford that. But of course, dental was uh, partially lumped into that uh, as part of the bill that was passed. And now we're starting to try to understand better the language around that bill, what its real impact is on the ground level for clinicians as they want to be compliant within, within the parameters. So the ADA put out a, um, a response just this week uh, about the No Surprise Act, actually wanting more clarification exactly about what they are going to, to require of dentists and, and how they hope to manage that. And if you think about it, we're in a really unique um, field, I think, because different from medical, most dental insurances have a cap, we'll say 1,500, 1,000, whatever that happens to be. And then all the services beyond that start coming out of pocket. Different from medical, it's usually the opposite. There's a cap of a deductible that you have to meet. And then once you meet that, most services are covered at a much higher percentage, if not 100%. So we're the inverse relationship of medical insurance. And so the question becomes, how can we really provide true good faith estimates to patients that come in wanting to seek care when we may not fully comprehend or understand how they have utilized their dental benefits throughout the year? Have they gone to other dentists, specialists, et cetera, received services? Are they capped or maxed at their allowable amount for the year and everything will be out of pocket? If you can appreciate the maximum or the, the range in, in this particular bill is $400. So if you do a crown for a patient and it gets denied by the insurance company, you have exceeded the good faith estimate unless you're requiring patients to pay in full and get reimbursed by their patients. And I, I think we can all appreciate that that is not happening as a normal practice for most dentists. Most will accept a copay or percentage payment and file the remainder with an insurance for reimbursement. So if we're going to start having to collect in full in order to be compliant with this particular law, I think it really changes the dynamics of our practices. So I'm glad the ADA is stepping up, wanting to have uh, deeper conversations with CMS to understand better what the real implications are. And does this mean that in actuality, if we exceed that $400 good faith estimate margin, that we can't be compensated for our goods and services that we're providing to patients. One of the comments that I found most uh, intriguing was uh, by the ADA, it's a quote, it's not appropriate to, re to require dental practices to have to issue a good faith estimate to the carrier when the carrier has no obligation to is issue an advanced explanation of benefits to the patient. They're not required for a pre-D or an update on their allowables. How can we be held to this to a different standard? So we'll stay tuned. We'll continue to watch that. I really don't have a lot of concrete information yet on what this looks like on the ground level, but we're definitely watching it very closely. The NIH also granted a, a sealant funding program just this week. It's a middle school sealant funding program. Uh, 
probably one of the first of its kind. The majority of the sealant programs that have been given grants from multiple organizations throughout the U.S. typically are focused on elementary and school-aged children. Uh, this particular program was focused more on middle school kids, really identifying 12-year molars and uh, wanting to begin to provide preventative care for that patient population as well. It was given to several university uh, dental schools that are going to go out and implement the program. This will be an interesting um, test program, I think, to see its efficacy and outreach and if it's able to achieve and accomplish uh, its desired goal. So we'll be watching that closely. I found an interesting financial, couple of financial tidbits for you. One, uh, the CAD CAM business segment within dentistry is expected to be a $5.3 billion industry by the year 2032. Just this year alone, it was $1.5 billion. And the interesting piece of this is how much emphasis is starting to uh, get focused on dental health and oral health awareness. There's a bill in the U.S. government focused on oral health literacy, and there's a lot of support behind that particular program to educate uh, the general population about oral health and systemic indications or systemic complications that come from that. But the WHO, the World Health Organization, also came out just recently in strong recognition and identifying dental caries and dental health issues as being one of the top health concerns in the world. They said one in four U.S. adults has dental caries, and there was a, a slightly less uptick for periodontal disease. So if that's untreated and undiagnosed dental disease, there's certainly a need for oral health education to get patients access to care. So it's interesting to see how the CAD CAM industry is also continuing to increase. We're seeing CAD CAM technologies that provide Quicker service, certainly, I think CAD CAM, the guys may feel differently, but I think CAD CAM, while an expensive early investment, allows doctors to sort of cost control a little bit better their outcomes. And now with CAD CAM technologies coming out with caries detection capabilities, et cetera, what would this look like if you were to include, uh, let's just say, an iTero scan with NERI technology in your middle school sealant program? and uh, really identifying dental caries from the get-go. I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities with these portable technologies and CAD CAM is sort of at the forefront of this. Lastly, I have to ask when the guys come back on, if they were early investors in Denticoin. Denticoin in 2018 was a cryptocurrency specifically invented for uh, consumers to purchase tokens, if you will, to provide to access or pay for dental services. Now, I don't think, based on probably our adoption of Denticoin, that it really took hold in the market. One of the large uh, groups that was primarily uh, advocating and receiving Denticoin as a primary source of currency, Lyft Dental, uh, silently, quietly, uh, is no longer taking Denticoin. So hopefully our Dinks listeners were not heavy early investors into Ticoin. Uh, maybe we'll see some emergence of a new type of cryptocurrency being accepted in dental practices. But to date, it won't be Denticoin. And that's the news. With that said, we do have an incredible guest waiting down in the wings. Um, Chad, would you do the honors of introducing Dr. Rouse? It would be it would be a great honor to introduce Dr. Rouse. So for those of you that don't know, Dr. Jeffrey Rouse maintains a private practice in San Antonio, Texas. He practiced with doctors Greg Kinzer and Frank Spear in Seattle, Washington. If you don't know who they are, look up Spear Institute and you'll realize real quickly who they are. Uh, in 2017, he became a member of uh, the resident faculty uh, at Spear Education in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is an amazing institution. He was also an adjunct professor in the Department of Prosthodontics at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio from 2004 to 2019, which is my alma mater, although I wasn't a prosthodontist. Uh, 
after graduating dental school, he did a two-year residency at uh, University of Connecticut, practiced dentistry for 12 years before returning for his prosthodontics degree from the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. He is a member of the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry, the American College of Prosthodontists, and the past president of the Southwest Academy of Restorative Dentistry. He is well-written. He lectures all over the place. He has a textbook uh, that he co-published with Dr. Bill Robbins called Global Diagnosis, A New Vision of Dental Diagnosis and Treatment Planning. And he um, is just an overall amazing dentist that I'm honored to have on the show. I know we all are. Uh, additionally, I, it was just brought to my attention, Dr. Rouse, that you are the president of the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry this year? Next year. Next yeah. year. All yeah. right. Well, Jennifer yeah. and I will see you there. We look forward to conversing with you there. So thank yeah. you for being here. No, it's my pleasure. And uh, so y'all need to upgrade your your drink. So <gasps> I'm drinking uh, Clase Azul Gold tequila. So oh, very nice. nice. How are you drinking it? Huh? Show us your glass. Oh, yeah. Does it okay. does it have a little bell that you can ring on top of it, like the uh, the yes, other it bottle? Does. Yes, it does. We yeah, just shame I'm... us on our own show. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> okay, so I'll I'll tell you what I'm drinking tonight. I'm drinking a little uh, vodka soda, but it's actually a vodka that Dr. John Kanka turned me on to called Wheatley. And the only reason that I'm drinking Wheatley or he turned me on to it is because he was pissed off that they didn't have the drink that he wanted at the bar, but they had this Wheatley vodka and he just kept turning to me going, this is good. This is really good, Chad. You got to try this. So I went to the store and they didn't have the vodka that I want. So I was like, I'll get John Kanka's vodka. So yeah, we, cost we only, you got, yeah. So that I can't, you've been away from San Antonio too long. That, that should be Tito's in there. That's right. You know, yeah. when Tito's took their distillery out of I Texas, say, I got a little mad at them. Yeah, yeah, so I'm I'm a deep Eddie guy. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'm a deep Eddie guy. You know so. that Tito's last name is Beverage? Yes. I went Tito was, I went to UT. <laughs> what? And uh Tito and I were members of the uh the end zone club for the UT football games. And I used to always yeah. see him and his name was Tito Beverage. I was like, there's no freaking way. Yeah. I was like, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Uh, my, it was, my next it was neighbor in the stars. Went to Do what, Jeff? I said, it, it, I guess was, it was just to in the stars. I mean, this was like yeah. re-anointed is what it sounds like. Yeah, he's he's got kind of a Michael Dell type of story as to how he got yeah. into vodka too. Really, really cool story. But we'll save that for another time. So, uh, By the way, Jennifer... Um, you brought me, I, you were talking about the North Carolina AGD. That was at the Umstead, which is, I've yeah. been there three times now. That That's is correct. my favorite hotel in the world now. I, I love that place. It's so amazing. That it, it I, I. Are you also lasted. still a vegetarian? No. Oh. So I'll give you an interesting story about that. I, 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 I don't know what birthday it was, but. I have a really good wine collection that I've, that when I was a vegetarian, I didn't drink any of it. So like five years or more. And I had a big birthday and I pulled out a really good bottle of wine, but I had it with something fish or something. I don't know. And it was a red wine and it was horrible. I mean, I mean, it was good, but it wasn't good. It wasn't great. Mm -hmm. It was, and this is a great bottle of wine. And I realized it's because I was eating it with the wrong food. And so yeah. I gave up being a vegetarian because I wanted to drink red wine. <laughs> Good <laughs> for you. <laughs> Jeff, for you. We love you more already. This he's is in, awesome. he's in the club. That. I have to say, because I didn't know that at the time, and we were hosting him for our meeting, and we were taking everybody to the Angus Barn, which is a local, you know, famous kind of place for steaks. I've taken you there too, Horowitz. And um, then oh, yeah. I found out he was a vegetarian en route to the restaurant night as a host. I felt pretty terrible that it was not going to be quite the same experience as, yeah. you know, I no, should have I'm picked back. something different. Anyway, I'm back on, so. I'm back on meat. Just for okay. Well, now I know. Yeah. <laughs> and and agree with you about the Umstead. Um, 
Oh you should, God, you should try getting sick there one time and just spending a few days in the bed. I, the year, <laughs> one of the years I was speaking at the at the North Carolina AGD, I came down with the flu as I was driving to the meeting, and literally just got so bad that I spent the entire weekend locked in that room at the Umstead, and that is the best place I've ever been sick. <laughs> yeah. It's great. I've, I've actually, there. I've only done there. I've been, I've done three meetings there and two weeks ago, some, I was with someone and I, and, um, and I said, actually, no, it was at Spear. And we were talking about experiences and the fact that in order to sell, in order to do larger cases, the experience has to be unique. Mm -hmm. You can't, it can't be an ordinary experience because they've been the people you're going to be doing this care for have been to dentists for 20, 30, 40 years. Your experience has to be unique. And my my example of unique was the Umstead. I was like this hotel, you walk in the door and they they somehow they know your name. Mm -hmm. So there is a way they know your name when you walk in the door. And um, they they. They give you a tour of the art as you go to the, your room. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. So it is. I always use or I, I when you when an when a unique experience in a hotel comes to mind, the Umstead is the one I always use because it's phenomenal. So mm -hmm. thank you. You know that's that. a that's, that's a I'm really so glad. That's a really great way to start this off because I think. Everything in dentistry, if you want to be the best that you can be, you yeah. have to provide the experience. And I think there's there's always something that you should be able to relate it to. And I'm always kind of a Ritz Carlton type of experience guy, but I've only experienced the bar at the Umstead, which I'm not going to say was a bad experience. It's a good, anyway, good bar. <laughs> before, yeah. They did not know my name. By the end of the night, they did on both occasions, but yeah. they did not know my name. When I well, at there, least so. security did anyway. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yes, yes, they, I got paged over the Umstead loudspeaker and asked to leave. Um, With the no. owner of a white minivan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Chrysler, Jeff, Chrysler minivan. We just want to make that clear. So, Jeff, tell us about your journey in dentistry, because as I was reading your bio and I, I read it a couple of times, it seems just a little bit different than the usual. So tell us about, you know, how you got started and where you ended up now. Um, all right. So I'll tell you the uh, I'll give you a couple of different versions of that, which is uh, the first part is no one realizes I do anything but airway. Yeah. Um, and they actually um, think airway means making sleep appliances. Mm -hmm. So that a ton of people nowadays are amazed that I actually do dentistry when I, you know, so I made zero, by the way, last year I made zero sleep appliances, traditional sleep appliances. Um, because I was able to figure out ways to make people healthy without going to that. So, they're surprised by that. Um, the other is that I sort of lucked into everything that I've done. Um, I went to Texas A&M in order to go to medical school because that's what my mom said I was supposed to do and um, decided along the way that that wasn't for me. And um, I was walking across campus after figuring that out after my third year and I, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? Because I'm through now. I, yeah, I heard it. I let it go the first time when you, you're like, oh, I was at UT. And was, I, I let it slide. I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> it'll, be fun, you, it'll be fun catching up on the rivalry soon. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> A couple more years. Um, the uh, I was walking across campus and I and I thought, well, I could be a high school biology teacher. No, nah, I don't want to do that. And then I thought. And I, I happened to walk by and look into a, a basement at, at a research place and on campus. And I, and I saw a guy working with a bunch of test tubes and stuff. And I said, oh, I could do that. And I thought, no, that sucks. I don't want to do that either. And I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And a friend of mine said, um, I'm going down to Houston next weekend to take the dental aptitude test. Um, 
you want to just go hang out down there for the weekend? I was like, fine. Yeah. So do you want to take the exam? I was like, sure, whatever. Cause it was cheap. I was like, okay, I'll do it. I didn't have anything else to do while he was doing that. On the way down, he threw By the way, Jeff, there are a lot of things that are cheap that you shouldn't do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. I've done, I've done a fair number of those. Yeah. And they were more fun than taking the DAT, let me tell you. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, he threw the booklet over at me and said, you might want to study this. And anyway, I did well enough to get into dental school. And um, then, uh, but I didn't know what a dentist did. I'd never, my mom hated dentists. She never took me. Um, I had no clue what they did. Um, but the guy in dental school said a C equals DDS. And I went, I can make a C, which I did. I just, I was right in the middle. <laughs> but my senior year, I met Bill Robbins, who you mentioned his name. And Bill, Bill was teaching the, I call them the gifted and talented. Um, but they were the honors bay or something like that. And I, um, I happened to put myself through college debating for Texas A&M and also working at ra in radio. And so I was used to doing research and speaking. And so Bill had a group that um, did research and gave presentations and I asked if I could join. And so because of that, it stimulated me to become better and go to a grad program. And then um, when I came back to San Antonio, set up my practice eventually evolved that practice into one that was doing high level pros and invited bill to actually join me in practice and then he did that in 96. so after four years of practice together um we needed to find some place to work together and teach and stuff and we never could find a location so we both kind of went near our houses set up our own offices but the same year I decided uh, I got divorced and I, I was like, what am I going to do now? And I thought I, I heard about a guy um, that was interviewing for a job in Auckland, New Zealand as the director of PROS. And I thought that sounds like a good idea. So I'll retire to Auckland, New Zealand. I just have to get the PROS certificate now. And on top of that, I was already teaching a bunch with Bill and it's like, if you call yourself a prosthodontist, and honest, you don't have to prove you know anything. People already give you the credit, you know, they just go, okay, you're a prosthodontist. So I went up and convinced the director in San Antonio to let me, let me go back to school. And I did it part-time. So at seven in the morning, I did um, all the lit stuff at the school and all the meetings. And then I practiced on patients until noon. And then I drove across town and practiced on my patients and then I saw my kids and then when I then when they were ready for bed, I got out and went back over to the school and worked till the middle of the night. And I did that for four years straight mm -hmm. and 2004 became a process. So awesome. from 2004 until 2017, I practiced in San Antonio. 2017, I was sitting in the back seat of 16, sitting in the back seat of Greg Kinzer's car out in uh, Scottsdale. And he said, uh, man, I'm so busy in my office in Seattle. I really need somebody. And I texted him the next day and said, I'll do that. So I split time between San Antonio and Seattle. So I got to practice with Frank Spear and Greg Kinzer and Bill Robbins. So and, it's and been a cool, tell cool us, journey. So tell us about the journey with, with Spear. Uh, you know, how did, how did that come about? And, and how did your role start at Spear? And, and where is it now? Um, so the journey at Spear was that I was teaching this airway information. And so I guess you have to back up. Spear has more influence in dentistry than everyone, than you, anyone really realizes. There's no group even close. They actually were trying to do comparables as far as impact and, you know, whatever level, impact, monetary, whatever it happens to be. And they joined every dental education facility in the world together, and they don't come close to what Spear does. So it, it, you may not recognize the impact, but it is, 
it's so huge in dentistry. And I didn't even know that. I mean, I, I heard that the other day and I'm like, Whoa. Um, so it, spear has this huge, huge, huge impact in dentistry. And I was teaching the airway stuff and, and Bill and I had written the textbook based on a lot of the things that Frank Spear had done, kind of our take on what he did. So I'd always had a tremendous amount of respect for him and had, um, been taught by him and the, um, but I knew they were missing a piece. I knew they were missing the airway stuff and I knew how important it could be. And so I, uh, I got together with them and I kept offering them the opportunity to just have it. I said, you know, just all you got to do is I'll come out there. I'll teach you everything I know. I'll give you everything I've got. I just think it's important that your students have this information because they don't have it right now. You're not teaching it and, and you're missing out. And so we went through it a bunch. Uh, I went to, Gary DeWood, I went to Greg Kinzer, I went to Bob Winter, I went to all these different people and find it. And we never could make this happen. And, and actually even Frank one time said, Oh yeah, or, you know, I heard, we're going to do this. We're going to, and we never could make it happen. And mm -hmm. um, finally I got really burned out. Um, and I called Bob Winter up, who's a friend of mine and said, what are the odds that, you know, that y'all would listen to this, you know, just listen to me. And we find, because I was just done. Um, y'all, I know all y'all teach, but I was teaching like, I was out 120 days. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was a big deal. And um, so I said, you know, what, what are the odds? And we finally arranged a meeting. And so to your point or your question, what did I want? I, I just wanted to, I knew they needed this information. I knew it would be valuable for people. And I just said, here, you can, you can have it. And Frank said, no, I want you to come to these different courses I teach. And then I want to hear your take mm -hmm. on it. And so what I was able to do is sit down and go, okay, this is what you said today, which is classic information that we've all heard. I said, here's what I heard. Here's what I saw. And after doing that with all the faculty, they're like, okay, this is different. And the neat part is that I went out there in 2017. I had been teaching or I had been working with Greg for a couple of years at that point. Cause the work with Greg wasn't related to going to spear. I just, it was cool. I mean, to be able to work with I mean, he's phenomenal. And just to be able to share an office with him was extremely good. Um, made me so much better. Um, but yeah, and, and uh, a year after we stopped working together, I, uh, I started teaching at Spear. And since 2017, Airway has kind of woven itself in like a virus into everything we do out there. So you can't go to a course without hearing the word Airway. No, and so, something else that happened to Jeff is... Um, you know, a lot of us who have been talking about the temporomandibular joint and, and function and really bringing all those disciplines together, you know, the joint, the airway, and then, of course, all of the occlusal and, and neuromuscular principles that, you know, that we were getting taught by the, by the spheres and the coices and, you know, and, and the great lecturers out there, the great prosthodontists out there. And so one of the things that I noticed, though, is so Gary DeWood and Jim McKee, who I both studied with at Piper, who were, you know, obviously very astute in, in studies of the temporomandibular joint, we started talking about airway at Piper, and that became a big thing. And then I know that Jim and, and Gary were doing a lot over at Spear. So how are, how are you guys incorporating all of those elements of functional dentistry together? Because I know when they're taught separately, they can seem like very different disciplines. But really, there is no 
sleep case that is not also a TMJ case or a TMJ case that's not a sleep case or a sleep and TMJ case that's not an occlusal dysfunction case of some type. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how are you guys, I, this is a big question, I know, but how are you guys bringing all of that together? Because I really think that's a hallmark for what we need to be doing in dentistry now, which is bringing all of these disciplines and not keeping them out here on the wings, but saying they all need to be a part of global diagnosis, as you talk about in, in your book. So, you know, it's another one of those, I was lucky to get to know people and get to know the right people. So Jim McKee is one of my best friends. Hey, he's and a great guy. I don't think, I don't think there's anyone on this earth who does not love Jim McKee. <laughs> so Jim and I set up starting about uh, 2014, 2013, 14. Um, we set a weekend aside where we invited people in and, um, and it was exactly your question. Like, how do you, how do you reconcile these two different viewpoints of the world? And we spend, we spent the entire weekend drinking and yelling at each other. And <laughs> so, because both of us are very strong in our beliefs as to what is the, the most important part of that. And while we both, I mean, my knowledge of the joint is, is so much, um, I, I understand the joint better than I would have if I had never not met him. And I had Mark and the Mark Piper in the office a couple of times. And by the way, if you ever invite speakers in, I think the way that we did it with Mark is the best ever, which is I said, I don't want you to lecture. I'm going to ask you questions for two days straight. And I just want you to, if you want to break your lecture out and show me bits and pieces from your lecture, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to hear a lecture. I want you to answer my questions. And so we just had questions. We had a bunch of people ask them questions. So it was really cool. So, um, so to so to your question about what do we do and how how do we reconcile it? Um, I agree. I think that the joint and uh, and the airway are are, um, are related to one another. Quite. Um, interrelated. However, I will, because uh, I think you mentioned the AES this year, this last year. Um, and I, I was actually out, I had a patient fly in from Utah as a dentist and, and he was there as well. And we were just recounting one of the, the issues where the, the things that happened at the very end that I think creates some, uh, clarification to your question, which was um, Whit Wilkerson asked a question of the group. There was a panel. It was Mark Piper, Jim McKee, myself. And he said, all right, there's a patient that comes into your office. It was the last question. Here it is. And he has this very long question that he had written out. And it was all about um, they have a left joint that does this and they have pain associated with these muscles and their bite looks like this in a seated condylar position and the, the cone beam looks like this and the MRI looks like this and blah, 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 blah. He goes through this whole long question. He goes, okay, I'd like you to begin with Dr. Piper. I'd like you to walk me through how you're going to handle this case and what you're going to do and you know what things that you would want associated with it. And, and I stopped him and I said, that's your problem. This entire group it, the problem is exactly what you just did. We've now spent 30 or 45 minutes taking questions and we've given presentations and you just ask an entire question based around the mandible and the joint. You never once mentioned where the maxilla was. There was not mm -hmm. a single mention of anything related to the maxilla and the maxilla is related to everything important which is the ability to breathe through your nose. That's the most important thing. And it has to be paramount in any treatment plan that you do. Because if you fix the joint and you fix the occlusion, but you leave the maxilla deficient, that patient will be sick. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed. So you cannot fix anyone unless you get the maxilla in the right location and you completely missed it. So when I had the conversations with Jim, I respect the joint information 
but it is secondary to what I would define the airway being, which is the maxilla. So my world lives in the maxilla. Give me in 3D the maxilla in the right location. Give me the transverse, the AP, the vertical, the cants. Give me everything in the maxilla in the proper position. Then we'll talk about the mandible. Well, because and, the mandible and, doesn't matter until then. Yeah. In my well, and life. very often freeing up the maxilla frees up the mandible. You know, I it mean, can, I absolutely. Yes. Had, had a patient today who absolutely and and i'm sorry i don't i don't mean to to steal this whole conversation but this is this is the stuff that that i live on and and this is the stuff that i think we need to be preaching to all dentists is how do we reconcile functional dentistry and address functional dentistry meaning get the airway straight first address the joint, address the occlusion. And that has to be of paramount importance before we start thinking about, you know, how we're going to shape our MODBL on light. I mean, that that's important too, but you know, I, it, that has to come afterwards when we decide where the bite's going to be and why the bite needs to be where it is. So let me, let me, <laughs> let me change your statement just a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt because no, I know please. I, I, I'm going to change the guest. <laughs> I'm going to change the the onlay and make it a more in, the most important one, which is we need to get all that taken care of before we put the implant in number nine. Because if you put an implant in on the anterior maxilla, you've screwed that patient's ability to be fixed at any point down the road. And and for me, that's the killer because I see too many times we rush to address structural biology rather than looking at aesthetics and function first, or however your view of the world, you know, whatever world you look at from a treatment planning perspective, you have, you cannot put an implant in the, the maxillary anterior in particular until you've got everything figured out. Cause that's just the death knell for any solution past that. It's so yeah. hard to, so, an onlay, yeah, okay. I get, I get what you're, where you're headed with that. That you want to make sure that you, that everything is set up perfectly before you do restorations. The biggest error that we make in dentistry is we, we put implants in the anterior maxilla without getting people healthy first. That's that's absolutely brilliant. And with your permission, I will probably use that instead of the onlay, because it, it makes so much sense. So. An example is a patient that I saw just today that had an obvious TMJ problem, had an obvious airway problem, and they had already started orthodontics. They were three months into ortho. And mm -hmm. what they said to me was that, you know, they, and, and they were a class two div two. So they were totally locked in anterior constriction case, you know, maxilla, I mean, Max, it's a bimax retrusion case, which most class twos are. It's not, it's not always the mandible like we think. Just as you're saying, you got to address the maxilla as well. And but what was really interesting about the case was, as bad as her symptoms had been, just having the ortho done on the maxilla, because with the div two, they only put the brackets on the maxilla to start to make room to, to go ahead and flare them out to get the brackets on the lower and just putting the brackets on the upper, opening that up just a little bit, her mandible came forward on its own and her TMJ symptoms were improved, still not completely gone. There was still some work to be done, which can be incorporated into the ortho. But to your point, and that, that's what this is for, is to kind of reinforce what you just said, just opening up that maxilla. She said, I can breathe better. I can sleep better. My joint feels better. Doing nothing other than putting brackets on the maxillary teeth that had poor inclination on them and in an arch that was just too small to start with. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and I know you know this, but those patients all have 
disc displacements on the medial pole and they're all down and back. And so all she did was seat herself and she's in That's a fully seated condylar position now. So her, her occlusion was pushing her off the disc. And so she's just moved into the idealized position now. So, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's a great cases. point. I just, I really yeah, want but, to reinforce what you said about yeah. the maxilla and how that truly is. We yeah. can move the mandible wherever we want and make a mismatch, or we can correct the maxilla and improve the airway at the same time because of nasal breathing. Yep. Yeah. And they also have better smile and better body. Yeah, right. And everything works out better. All the other benefits. Jeff, can we talk a little bit about pediatric airway as well? Because I think that's sure. a bit of a, maybe a soft spot for you? Or a uh, Because of my passion? son? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I don't treat kids anymore. I was a family dentist when I, when I, when I was a, a general dentist. Um, so... Um, and, and as a family dentist, I saw all, in fact, we started seeing kids at six months, uh, was our first visit. Cause we would, uh, educate the parents about what's coming and yeah. teething and cleaning. And so six months was when we would see them. So I, I started seeing kids when I was a general dentist at six months and, and we worked from there because I hated that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I went into pros. <laughs> Actually, I remember there was a kid that we used to sedate kids, and uh, he took a drink of the stuff we were going to sedate him with, and he spit it all over my assistant and yelled, I hate you, Carol. And so <laughs> that was the end of pediatrics in my practice. Um, but I, I did ortho. I, I mean, I had, I had experience with that. So, um, so, so while I don't treat children anymore, I do have a, a special interest in um, screening them. And, and I have a team put together that can take care of any airway issues related to that I may find with the kids. And it's because of my son. Um, my interest in airway issues actually came from a research project I did in the office on bruxism. And so... It didn't start with my son. It um, it actually the guy I had in town today I went through the same journey where he heard me lecture, and then he goes, "I looked at my son and went, oh, you've got all this stuff." Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened to me. I started researching the bruxism stuff, and then I got into the airway and went, "Wait a second. And then I started piecing it together at that point. So unfortunately, I was behind. Um, which a lot of people figure out when they come to the course, they're like, ah, that was my kid and I missed it. And that's what happened to me. Uh, Jake w was the colicky kid from the beginning. He had reflux. Um, he was horrible sleeping. Um, he would never go to sleep. Um, I remember laying with him going, okay, just lay still for two minutes. And he'd go one minute. I go, no, two minutes. He go, no, no, one minute. I was like, all right, one minute. You can't tell time. Who, uh, it'll yeah, be all right. fine. <laughs> I, I was yeah. like, I mean, and that's the stupidest thing. It's like <laughs> two minutes, you know, like, no, one minute. And like two minutes. No, I'm the dad. It's two minutes. It's like, Jesus Christ, he didn't tell time. Yeah. He didn't know <laughs> how long it's going to be. Really what quick, am I arguing that, for? Just a really like, quick digression. Is he still challenging you to this day? Oh, my God, yes. Yeah, yeah he's 18. He just started his freshman at A&M. Um, yeah, no, he's a pain in the ass even today. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about him. He's, yeah, his, in fact, that's a good idea. I think I'm going to get a t-shirt made for Christmas for him that says two minutes on it. That's exactly that. what you should do. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. And then you know the what? No says, man will ever wear a t-shirt that says two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one audience. It, it's not like he's trying to sell it on a right a yeah. shop or something. All right. So back yeah. to your son, you're seeing all these things. Yeah, so he had um, he would have sinus infections, ear infections. Um, we'd put him on uh, antibiotics for a couple of weeks. It'd go a month, and then he'd start up again. And 
you knew when you heard him on the baby monitor talking in his sleep that he was going to wake up with a fever. And the fever was like 100, 400, 5. Oh. It was crazy how fast. And uh, three surgeries before the age of six, ortho and, and protraction at seven. And um, still he ended up with um, uh, ADHD, um, anxiety, um, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia. And now when I started lecturing about it, it's interesting. Um, when I started lecturing about all this stuff, I would have to take articles and kind of like tell a story. Here's an article that says this. Here's an article that says this. Now let's, let me tell you a story as to how these two articles actually say what I'm going to say. So you kind of had to, you had to um, massage things into what you knew was true, but you couldn't prove by the literature. Right. Today, you don't have to do that anymore. Today, the literature is replete with articles saying attention deficit and airway are absolutely related to one another. And, and that if they have an airway issue, you, you know, or if they have attention deficit, you need to be evaluated for airway issues. And if you want to avoid that, you need to get to their airway issues as soon as possible. So the, there is no doubt on these things today, uh, like there was when Jake was growing up. So Do you see the uptick on pediatrics really accepting and embracing that? Pedi pediatrician? Pediatrician? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that'll never happen. Yeah. Here's, I, I was, when you and I were talking, I was the guy trying to get, because I had an ENT in my office, right? So I had, yeah. I was trying to, to build those bridges. I, I, those bridges are never going to be built. Never. Don't even try. Don't even try. Just move on with life and do dentistry. Just do dentistry. Because den dentistry can have so much impact. We don't need the physicians. And don't don't fight it. If you happen to have a great relationship, that's awesome. I love it. If you happen, if that person exists in your community, that's fantastic. I'll tell you how to maybe find them if you want to find them, if you need to find them. If you have a PD, you know, obviously you need an ENT that's going to take out tonsils and adenoids. I'll tell you how to find that person. But don't waste your time trying to grow a big practice based around that. Just go do dentistry. Do whatever you can do. You don't, it, no. So I know, Jeff, you do a bunch with medicine and with medical insurance and all that stuff. That's cool, having those kind of practices. Um, Jameson Spencer is actually next year starting to teach the course with me out in, in mm -hmm. Scottsdale. So we're actually dividing the course up because I always would teach up until, like I wouldn't teach how to make the sleep appliance when you got to that end point. And now Jameson's going to come on and teach it. Jameson's world is is set up to um, act like a physician. He has people that know how to do medical billing. And and I mean, it's, it's but, but that, a regular guy point, in practice isn't going to That's not an easy practice it. model, Jeff. I no, mean, it's, it, ter it, it's terribly to hard. Point, it is a very difficult and people who think that they can just go and make connections mm -hmm. and do that. It's really a big stretch. I mean, yeah. that, we aren't even teaching it. Yeah. Jameson is going to say, you can't compete with me. Now I hate to take the words out of his mouth, but I'm yeah. going to. So I think what he'll say <laughs> is <laughs> you can't compete. You can't compete with me. So don't. Just be a dentist. And if it gets to the point where a sleep appliance is an appropriate thing to make, charge them for it. Don't mm -hmm. don't try to play the medical game. It's too it's too hard. And and that's the same with don't play the medical game with all this other stuff either. You just it's too hard. Just do it. Just be a dentist. And the neat part is that the literature is now starting to be supportive of the, the huge impact that we can actually have on our patients. Um, that literature, by the way, is like the early ADHD stuff, right? Where I had, you have to tell a story. And the reason you have to tell a story is because we will never in dentistry invest enough to do these huge studies that's required to up our level of 
um, quality of our literature. We're going to have to do meta-analysis where, where we take 10 studies of 30 people to get one of that equals something, you know, a 300 person study, right? So your dentistry is just not going to come up with a 300 patients or 3000 patient type of study ain't going to happen. Um, so we're still having to piece that kind of stuff together, but you know what, at the end of the day, if you move people, if you expand an arch and you create this idealized maxilla, what's the worst thing that happens? They have a great smile with good bite. That's the worst thing that happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the downside of that? It's like, right. that's cool. And if they so, happen to breathe better, then we all rejoice. And, and, and going back to your original statement, which I loved, that you made zero appliances appliances are what you do when somebody is not gonna go for the true fix appliances should be the secondary answer because in dentistry without medical insurance we have ways to actually improve apnea to a point where it may not be an issue that requires a cpap or an oral appliance anymore. And I think what we what we failed to talk about, and, and I'm so glad that you said this at the beginning of the show, what we failed to talk about is that we have all these opportunities in dentistry to make that better before we ever start talking about oral appliance therapy or, you know, or, or CPAP therapy or Inspire therapy or whatever you're gonna send them for which are band-aids when we could be doing something to really address the etiology of the disease. So kudos. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Inspire. Actually, the people it doesn't work on have maxillary deficiencies. Uh, so I have a gastroenterologist we're treating that is still in an oral appliance after Inspire therapy. So, yeah. yep. So the, the patients that it will not work on have premolar and molar constrictions in the maxilla. So just, it, it just, it's crazy. I the, break out that the, second bottle of tequila. I'm getting another bottle of wine. Yep. We're doing this for another hour. <laughs> we, yeah, we there's, a, there's an ENT group in Brazil that's now showing that, that um, premolar molar constriction in the maxilla is related to all these problems and all you, you just have to fix them. You just, if you change it, it you, you don't need to make it, those appliances. By the way, while I, I said I didn't make a single sleep appliance, I actually sort of misspoke in a way. What I meant was mandibular advancement appliance, a traditional yeah. sleep appliance. I do make appliances that people sleep in, like night guards, anterior repositioning appliances, I, I other types of appliances. So um, I just don't think we need to go full bore like I used to six, seven, eight, ten 10 millimeters worth of protrusion in the mandible. I don't, I honest to God, don't think anyone needs that anymore. Yeah. It's pretty rare. It's pretty darn rare. In fact, there was a study recently, uh, 2019 or 20 where, that showed that 80% of the patients resolve at three millimeters or less protrusion on a, on a traditional sleep appliance. Um, and so, I mean, the problem is with traditional sleep appliances, you would never start them at two millimeters of protrusion because you would have to reset the appliance along the way. So, Jeff, will um, you come back and and because uh, we are running out of time now, we're we're actually past time. But um, honestly, I'll come back we anytime can talk you want. To you all night because this is what we try to do here: is just have honest discussions and and just talk about the stuff that's out there and. You know, evidence-based dentistry is wonderful, but we all know, you know, having written some of the articles and we know that there's an inherent bias in a lot of the literature that's out there. And, you know, just as in ortho, you know, they're, they're citing literature that says premolar extraction does not cause an airway disturbance, you know, and you, depending on how you structure the data, 
you can make it support what you want to support. And, and we all have seen in, in clinical practice, you know, what happens when you put 14 millimeters of space in an arch that only has five millimeters of crowding and the rest is absorbed in retraction and making the arch smaller. So um, with all that said, I, would you be willing to come on another time? Cause I, I'd love to carry the conversation on. Um, yeah. But I always like, I, I love being the most frequent guest on any podcast. So there you <laughs> wait, oh, we need to make like SNL, the five timer, the five timer robe. Will you be Alec Baldwin? He Will needs you be? to be our five-timer <laughs> I, guy. I've even got oh, a better yeah, question. Steve, Steve Martin, right? <laughs> yeah, and, um, wait, uh, the guy with the cowbell. Come on, guys, help me out. Will Ferrell? Will Ferrell. No, no. I need more cowbell. Oh, Chris. Uh, oh, Christopher Walken. Yes, he was on it yeah. time, too. Yeah. Okay, so so here's the real like question. Two-timer, three-timer, four-timer. I think that's a thing now. JB, let's do something really fun. Next time we have Jeff on, Yeah. let's shut Jeff H.'s mouth mic off. We can and, mute him. And, and see if we can just have a conversation with Jeff Rouse and make Jeff just sit there like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> so, also, well, you yeah. know, this, this, was your, this was yours, Jeff. So next time it's Chad's version. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man, Chad's I, you know what? I... I am I am very joyous just being the sponge, and yeah. tonight I was the sponge. It just was was great to hear two great minds. I mean, you and Jeff, uh, both Jeffs think alike. Um, I love you all feeding off of each other. This was this was very enlightening, and I think that uh, my next course at Spear is going to be yours. So, same. Look forward to it. Also, yeah, Jeff, think, uh, we, Ashley, we're paying Ashley you tonight. Owes us one, so we'll be out there. So. We'll be paying you tonight in Denticoin. So. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, sure that's how that we in. all get paid on Dennis. That's how we get paid. So, yeah. You know. yeah. Dr. Rouse, will you accept 50,000 bits? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm I'm still analog my with my wax ups. I don't know if there I can do that. <laughs> there you I don't go. Know if I can do Bitcoin. <laughs> the exchange rate is the same as leprechauns to unicorns, so you'll figure uh, it out. <laughs> so right, well, chatty. We're over time. You better close us out, bud. I'm gonna close us out. I just want to say thanks to Dr. Rouse. Uh, thanks to Dr. Horowitz for asking so many great questions of Dr. Rouse. It was just so enlightening. It was amazing. Thanks to Spear Education for sponsoring such a wonderful show. Uh, always good to be on the show with a fellow Texan. And I'm just going to close this out by saying, hook them. All right. Uh, I knew that was coming. <laughs> hey, great good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, guys. And that wraps up another podcast for Dennis in the Know. On behalf of Dr. Jennifer Bell, Dr. Chad Duplantis, and myself, remember that we've got a great profession, so let's make it a great day, dinks.